My father-in-law loves peanut butter. And there's a joke in my family that when my father-in-law was deciding whether or not I would be okay as a son-in-law, uh, that he saw all he needed to know uh, when I sat down with him to eat a peanut butter and fried egg sandwich. That's the reaction I usually get when I talk about the peanut butter and fried egg sandwich. It's one of my favorite uh, breakfasts in the morning. I had it this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, the response I usually get is, what kind of weird combination is that? Who thought of that? The joke is uh, he decided that I would be a decent son-in-law, well, I think, uh, from that snapshot of me. Um, of course, the reality is he knew me for quite longer than that. Uh, but you know, there are times when you see just a snippet of somebody's life and you come to conclusions based on that little snapshot, right? This happens all the time with job interviews. You just get a snapshot and you make a decision. And sometimes even your decision to, uh, on who to spend the rest of your life with comes from just seeing a few snapshots, like that old story of a young woman who was trying to decide whether to marry a young man or not. Uh, she liked him, she loved him, but her mom was not the healthiest, and she was wondering how this possible future husband might act towards her mom, and she finally decided to marry him when she saw him from far away. He didn't know she was there, but he was helping an older woman with her groceries across the street, and she decided, that's it, right? And that snapshot told her something about his character, who he was as a person, not who he was when he was trying to impress her. Snapshots. In the scriptures today, we have a snapshot of a man named Joseph. And we don't read much else about Joseph in the rest of the scriptures. But I believe that this snapshot has so much to tell us, and not just about Joseph, but about God being with Joseph and what that could mean for God being with us. Today is the second Sunday in Advent, and during Advent, we are in a message series called God with us that takes us through the stories of the first Christmas. Last Sunday, we looked at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and how God was with them and what that might mean for God being with us. And today, we look at God being with Joseph. Now, we read in the passage that Joseph and Mary were pledged to one another. In that ancient context, pledging had the force of marriage. It could actually only be ended by divorce. It was a social and legal contract. They were bound together, and the expectation was that they would remain faithful to one another, and they would not consummate their relationship with each other until they were formally married about a year after pledging. That was their culture and their context. So, given that, you could imagine the weight of what's happening here. And what Joseph might be thinking and feeling when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. It's not his child. And according to her story, God did it. Mary's pregnancy is a seeming violation of their pledging covenant. And according to the laws of the time, she could be stoned to death. And at the very least, there's going to be a stigma on Mary, on her child, and on Joseph if he chooses to stay with her. That's a little bit of the background of what's going on here. Now, we know at the end of the story that Joseph and Mary stay together and they raise Jesus. But what I want you to notice is what verse 22 tells us. It tells us that all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So get this. What happened in Joseph's life, this snapshot of this drama, it is showing Joseph that God is with him, and it is fulfilling God's promise to be with all of us. What I want to share with you today is two implications I see for our lives that come from the way that God was with Joseph, and then I want to close with some practical applications. My hope is that you would come to trust and experience in this season that God 
is with you as well. The first implication I see is this, that we can experience God with us in our lives as we choose beyond what is right to what is good. Verse 19 tells us some of Joseph's reaction when he finds out what's going on with Mary. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And in there, you see Joseph's inner conflict. You can imagine that, right? He wants to do what is right. He needs to think about himself, his family, his reputation. But also, he's conflicted because he has a heart of mercy. He does not want to see Mary be disgraced because of this. And so his solution, as far as he can think of, what he thinks is the right thing to do is to separate himself from her quietly. Maybe he can make it disappear, and that's the best thing he can think of for himself and for Mary. But verse 20 goes on to say this, After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And we're told in verse 24 that when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. What I see here is that Joseph chose to go beyond what he thought was right to choose instead what was good and of God. God revealed that he was with him through the angel and showed him a choice beyond what was right. And as he made that choice, Joseph would go on to witness and to experience more of God being with him in his life. He would even get to be with God in the flesh as his adoptive son. And he would live with Jesus, God in the flesh, for decades. Friends, I wonder this. If perhaps we also can witness and experience more of God's presence in our lives as we lay down what we think is right and choose instead what is good. You know, we can see in our culture, in all of its issues, that the conversation or the lack of conversation revolves around the question of who's right, of what is right. And everyone has a tendency to think that they themselves are right. Right? But we don't need to look into the culture to see this tendency. We just need to look at our own lives and around ourselves. Because we see ourselves, our own marriages, our own families, and that's all you need to see, to see that everybody thinks they're right. But being right, friends, may not always be good. I remember my brother and I got into this heated argument as adults. I don't remember what we were arguing about, but it got pretty bad. And we actually went to our father and said to him, as adults, Dad, I say this, my brother says this, who's right? Tell us. And of course, I said this to my dad thinking, obviously my dad will say I'm right. (laughs) My dad looked at the two of us and said, you are both evil. We were so shocked, we just stopped talking. End of argument. And I think that's when I started to learn that being right is not always good. You know, Jesus said something similar to this. There's a story in John chapter 8 about a woman who gets caught in the act of adultery. Jesus is teaching in the courts of the temple, and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they drag this woman to make her stand in front of them and in front of Jesus. And they say to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They're trying to trap Jesus. If Jesus says, no, don't stone her, he's breaking the law. If Jesus says, go ahead and stone her, 
then his mercy towards other people and all that he's been doing about that, that goes out the window. So what do you do? Now these Pharisees and teachers of the law, they're so concerned with what is right, with being right, proving Jesus wrong, and they're so concerned about that that they trap this woman, right, in this unfair kind of trial, so to speak. They try to trap Jesus, and they forget, conveniently, to bring the adulterous man in front of them in the process. Well, Jesus stoops down to write on the ground, and when they keep insisting, he tells them this, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. And one by one, from oldest to youngest, they drop their stones and leave because they know none of them is without sin. I think that's where my dad got the response, you're both evil, you're all of you, you're evil. Jesus had a lot more tact, but he's the only one left. And he's the only one who has no sin. He's the only one that can condemn her for what she's done. And what does he do? He says to her, I do not condemn you. Go leave your life of sin. Jesus does not choose what is right. Jesus chooses what is good, what is godly. What if all of us, instead of thinking who's right, what's right, I'm right, I have my rights, instead of that, we started to ask, well, what is good and what is of God? What if in our arguments with our spouses, instead of thinking, I'm right, you're wrong, we started to ask the question, wait a minute, what is good in this situation? What if we did this in our quarrels with our children, with our parents, with our siblings, with our coworkers, and we changed the question from who's right to what is good? Maybe if we were to start asking that question, And then choosing to do what is good and godly, we would then experience more of God's presence in our lives. The second implication I see of God's presence with Joseph is that we can experience God with us in the scandals that we face in life. This completely flips what we think because a lot of the time we think, well, God is with us when everything is going well, when everybody's good, when everybody's got it all together. But what I see here is that God's, we can experience God with us even in the scandals that we have in life. Listen, Matthew 1.18 tells us this. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice, the verse starts by saying, this is how the birth of Jesus happened, and then it talks about what would be a potential public scandal at the time. It does not say, this is how the birth of Jesus came about. Joseph and Mary were happily married, and as couples do, they have a bright and beautiful child that everybody's proud of. When we think of Christmas nowadays, we often think of good holiday feelings, the pleasing holiday music, the good times we look forward to with others, and all that is good. But do you know, Christmas started with what looks like a scandal. I hope we don't forget this because it is so powerful if we do not. Let me explain. Again, all of this happened to fulfill what God had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The prophet who said that was the prophet Isaiah. And when Isaiah was speaking these words, he was talking to a king of God's people named Ahaz hundreds of years before Jesus. Ahaz was not a good person. Ahaz was not a good king. Scripture tells us in 2 Kings 16 that Ahaz sacrificed his own child in the fire 
He burned him up as an offering to some god. Ahaz was hoping that that god, whatever god it was, would give him some sort of advantage in life. So he sacrificed his own kid. He gave up his own son for his own selfish desires. Ahaz engaged in detestable practices and did not follow God. And it was during his no good kingship that two other kings attacked and laid siege on the capital city of Jerusalem where he was. Ahaz and his people were shaking with fear. What's going on? What do we do next? That's when Isaiah the prophet showed up and told him, Ahaz, God says these two kings are going to be gone. Stand firm in your faith. Keep calm and don't be afraid. I think that's where the t-shirts came from. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. And he said, ask God for a sign to prove this and he will show you. Ahaz said, no, I'm not going to ask God for a sign. And Isaiah says to him, you know what? God is asking you to ask him for a sign. And you're not going to do it. God is going to give you a sign. And that sign is the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. And before that child is old enough to eat curds and honey, those two kings will be gone. Isaiah is telling the king, babies cannot eat honey until a year old, right? Isaiah is telling the king, within a couple of years, these two kings that you think are such a threat to you are going to be gone. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Keep your faith. God is with you. You see, even though Ahaz was not a good king, and even though God's people were not all following him at the time, God still showed up and said, I'm still with you. So when Matthew applies Isaiah's words to Jesus, what he's saying is, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus shows us that God is with us even though we're not always with him. Jesus was born into a scandal. Jesus died in a public scandal, the scandal of the cross, right? Remember, the cross is a shameful public execution. Jesus is born into scandal. Jesus dies in a scandal. Why? All of it to show us that God is with us. God is with the broken. God is with the sinner. God is with the ashamed. God gets himself messy. Jesus shows us that God chooses to be with us in the scandals we have in our lives. When Joseph chooses to stick with Mary and the stigma that she will have. When Mary chooses to take on this scandal in her life. They are both pointing to what their son Jesus will do. When Jesus takes on all the sin and all the shame, and all the brokenness of humanity on the cross. Friends, do you find yourself with sin, with brokenness, with shame in your life today? Do you find yourself with stigmas and scandals in your life or in your family? Are there prayer requests that you cannot tell anyone about. If that's you, do you know you are the reason why Jesus came? You're the reason why Jesus came. In verse 21, the angel told Joseph, Joseph, give the baby the name Jesus. Why? Because he's going to save people from their sins. And just like a firefighter gets into the fire to save, a lifeguard gets into the water to save, just like a parent has to get into the poop to clean their baby, so God steps into sin, into shame, into brokenness, and the scandals of our lives to save us, to heal us, to forgive us, to make us new. And if you find yourselves in such things today or ever, it is as you turn to God in the midst of what you're going through that you can experience God with you right there. 
So if you're not a follower of Jesus, I invite you to put your trust in Jesus today because he loves you. He gave his life on a cross so you could be forgiven and healed and follow him in a close relationship with him of love that lasts now till forever. So turn from life without Jesus to life with Jesus. We call that repentance, where you give up life without Jesus and you take on a new life of following him and his ways. You can do that by praying to him for forgiveness, healing, and help to follow him. And if you do that for the first time today or any day, please tell somebody, tell me, and join a church family to follow Jesus with others. For all of us, I offer you two practical applications from these implications that I've shared with you, and I know they can be challenging. First, I ask you, where do you need to go beyond what is right to what you think is right, to what is good and what is godly? Do you know, all of us choose what we think is right because we think that's good. What is right and what is good has become a matter of personal preference. But that is where sin started, where Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit because they thought it was a good thing to do, even though God had told them not to. So if we want to know what is truly good and what is truly godly, we have to get back to God. We need to get into the scriptures, into God's word, and start asking this question, what would Jesus say is good? Joseph laid down his own sense of right. He was humbly willing to be corrected and change direction from what he thought, even to the point of not consummating their marriage until after Jesus was born. That's how much he laid down what he thought would be the right thing to do. And maybe what we need to do is to lay down our own sense of what is right, lay down what we even think are our rights, and seek God as to what God will say is good. Maybe we need to read scripture Less with the thought of, this is how the Bible supports what I think, and more the thought of, how is God wanting to transform the way I think? Because the application of what is good is going to be different for different people in different contexts. For example, if your sense of what is right is to be nice all the time, then what is good might be for you to stop being nice. If your sense of right is whatever makes you right and other people wrong, then what is good might be for you to admit you're wrong. If your sense of right is anything that makes your life more comfortable, then what is good might be you getting uncomfortable because there's something greater than your comfort. Doing what is good might be giving tough love instead of being nice. Doing what is good might be being nice rather than giving tough love all the time. It might be giving grace. It might be giving truth. It might be setting boundaries. It might be breaking boundaries. Good might be getting rest and getting comfortable. Good might be getting uncomfortable. I think it'll be different depending on your journey with God in your context. And I invite you to seek God personally. Get into the Bible, into the scripture, study them, learn them, and in faith, apply what is good in your life. Second, in what way can you show God's presence in the brokenness of our world? In this Advent Christmas season, rather than jumping on the bandwagon and the rush to buy presents, trying to have a good time, pretending that brokenness and scandals don't exist, maybe you could do something that demonstrates to yourself and to those around you, God is with us. God is really with us. Maybe for you that means forgiving other people. Maybe for you that means standing with other people in the midst of their brokenness 
praying for them, telling them that they're loved. Maybe for you it means sharing your faith story of how you have come to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe it means helping those who need help. One thing I think we can all do together is to bring in diapers for our annual diaper drive for the ministry of the Maker's Place in Trenton. The Maker's Place is a diaper bank and a resource center in Trenton for families in need. Did you know one in three families in the United States do not have enough to cover diapers for their babies? And the households that have a shortage of diapers have an average of 50 diapers a week that they're short. Sorry, 50 diapers a month that they're short. With prices rising, there's even less to go around. And so I invite you as you're able to bring in packages, boxes of diapers all December. Because as a church, this may be one practical thing that we can do together to say, we're not looking to who's right and what's right. We're looking to do what is good. Because I tell you, half the people in Trenton, or at least half the families in need, will disagree with half the people in our church about half the issues of life and culture and society and politics, and will raise half their children to believe half of what they believe. So you can either say, well, I think I'm right, and they're wrong. So I'm not going to help them raise their family. Or we can do what is good. And as a church, we can do this one practical thing together to say, God is with us. And God is with them. God is with us all. I close with this. I met a man once some years ago who wanted some advice regarding getting married. He was looking to get married to a woman who was already a mother of four children. We talked about several different things, and when it came to the subject of the four kids, I asked him about it, but we did not need to talk about much because this is what he said to me. He said, those four children would be his. He would be their father, and they would be his children, and he would not think differently. I saw in that moment somebody who was choosing not just what is right, but what is good. That specific choice may not be for everybody, but Joseph chose what is good in the midst of a scandal, and he got to witness more of God's presence in his life. So where are the people in our day who will go beyond what is right to choose what is good? Where are the people who will go beyond thinking about their rights to choose what is godly? Where are the people who will demonstrate God's goodness and presence to a world that really needs to see it? And where are the people who in the Christmas season will demonstrate and show and share the love of Jesus Christ? Aren't those people right here in this room? Aren't you the ones who follow Jesus? For God is with us. He has shown us that in Jesus Christ. So let us be those who choose what is good and what is godly in the midst of the darkness and scandals of our world. And let us witness and experience all the more God's presence with us. Amen.